forgot to mention that Brother Mitchell is sitting out in the front. He was hurt pretty severely recently. Hey, Mitch, you don't jump up and come in here and say hi? No. <laughs> but glad that he's doing, doing better as well. I noticed Deanne's not with us this morning, so I don't know if he, he he got into it. You know, he couldn't outrun her, so he just told her stay home. I don't I don't know, but oh, okay, <laughs> all right. Exodus chapter twelve is where we'll be reading this morning. Today is actually on the um, on our Christian calendar. Today is Palm Sunday. Thus, the palm leaves up here in the front, and it was the Sunday that uh, before Easter, the Sunday that Jesus came into Jerusalem riding on the donkey, and remember all the people were shouting, Hosanna, Hosanna to the Son of David. Hosanna is a word akin to our hallelujah, so they were rejoicing, Hosanna, hallelujah, like we would, uh, it's, a, it's a good day. Uh, there was lots to rejoice about. Their, their Messiah, their, their son of David, their king was, was making himself known. And to them, they thought that, uh, uh, of course, he was going to free them from Roman uh, rule and, and set up the kingdom again as it was under David. And, of course, that was not what Jesus was here to do. Uh, I, I guess I probably had uh, noticed it once before, but you know, when you're old as I am, you forget what you did yesterday, much less 20 years ago in studying a passage or delivering a passage, but it, it just uh, re-dawned on me, I guess, this week that uh, during this last week is where Jesus was asked all the questions. You know, Ma- Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John all tell the story of Jesus' life and leading into the last week and leading up to the uh, crucifixion and the resurrection, but Matthew, Mark, and, and, John, and, Matthew, Mark and Luke don't, don't tell it all in the same order. So you see uh, a little different order in these three uh, books, and that's as it would have been any eyewitness. Uh, it'd be suspect if uh, everything was exactly the same. You'd think they got together and collaborated and, and wrote it all down. But when they just, led by the Holy Spirit, just write it from, the, from their perspective, we get it in, in a little different order. But this last week is when Jesus was before the, the Pharisees and the Sadducees. And I mean, they were just questioning him mercilessly until it gets down to where, and they ask him no more questions, because he had done put them in their place. He had already shamed them. The reason for that, the reason that's so important, is on the the triumphal uh, Sunday that he came into town, corresponds to the time, the tenth day of Nisan, when the Jews would take that little lamb and bring it into the house and inspect it for those next four or five days and to make sure that it was perfect and without blemish in order then to to be able to sacrifice that lamb. That's exactly what Jesus did on Triumphal Sunday is present himself to the Jewish people to be inspected for the next four or five days in every way they could. That's not what they thought they were doing. They, they were trying to trick him so that indeed they could crucify him. When they couldn't do that, of course, they lied about him. They got false witnesses. And even Herod said, I find no fault in this man. This was the perfect sacrifice that even Pilate could find no fault in. And he died on the cross, as Mike just prayed about, for our sins. And we just sung about, when I see the blood, I'll pass over you. What if they couldn't have trusted that? What if God had not proven himself trustworthy and they weren't sure? Uh, you know, you don't want to go out and kill a whole bunch of your prized lambs and, and it be for, for, no, for no effect, no good. But they took God at his word. He said, God said, when I see the blood, I will pass over you. When you see the term Independence Day, uh, how many of you thought of a movie? <laughs> you know, there's a movie. But maybe you thought of the 4th of July, you know, that's, uh, 
Uh, Independence Day is our 4th of July. Do you know that the Canadians don't spend 4th of July quite like we do? They, for some reason, they just don't find it a reason to ce celebrate. I had the opportunity to spend 4th of July in Canada on a fishing trip some years ago. And, and to their credit, because they knew we were there's five or six of us Americans, one of the neighbors that we were fishing with, just throwed a big barbecue and, and grilled hamburgers and brats, and we just had a big time celebrating the 4th of July in Canada. But uh, had we not been there, they just, it just wasn't such a big deal to, to them. I wonder why. I hadn't figured that out yet. Y'all let me know. But anyway, when you think of Independence Day for Israel, you have to think of Passover. Passover was Independence Day for 430 years. Way longer than our nation's been here, but for 430 years, they had been in bondage. Now, they didn't start out in bitter bondage, but they ended up, so we don't know how many years, but they ended up in bitter, cruel, just unbelievable bondage to the Egyptian people. And I preached through this uh, some years ago and called it the second greatest story ever told because the meaning of this second greatest story ever told comes, comes to fruition in the greatest story ever told. And that is that Jesus Christ died on the cross as the Lamb of God that takes away the sins of the world. That you and I might be freed from the bitter bondage of sin. And so it's the perfect picture. I was talking about it this morning, and Grayson started telling me the story of Moses and Pharaoh. Let my people go. No, I'm not. Don't let my people go. And that's part of the story, isn't it, Grayson? And that's good. I tried to get him to tell it this morning, but he just backed out on me. But we know it's a, it's a great story, but my, it's not just a story, is it? It's what it means to the, both the Jewish people uh, and to us. So for these 430 years, they'd been in captivity. And then Moses, then God sends Moses, the deliverer. Of course, he fought it on every step of the way, but uh, finally God convinced him that he indeed was going to uh, free Israel through him. And so he ends up before Pharaoh in nine plagues. I mean, one plague after another, the just tremendous hardship on the nation of the people of Egypt. And they just, from Pharaoh on down, hardened their hearts and, and uh, wouldn't, wouldn't let the people go, wouldn't repent, wouldn't, wouldn't listen to Moses' message. And then the tenth plague is the plague that God told Moses, they'll let you go free after this. Not only will Pharaoh set you free, uh, you'll be able to plunder uh, Egypt. They'll, they'll willingly give you of all the gold and silver and, and probably food and household. Every, I mean, in fact, the Scripture says they emptied <laughs> Egypt. And so with all of this and millions of people that are getting ready to exit us out of uh, Egypt, uh, we find this tenth plague, and the tenth plague was the death of the firstborn of all of Egypt, all firstborn children of Egypt, all the firstborn of livestock would, would die. Well, Israel was in Egypt, and all the firstborn of Israel would have died. I mean, all the, God said he was going to kill all the firstborn of Egypt. But then there was an exception. And you know, when we look at our lives today, all people that... Uh, uh, it's accounted unto man once to die, and after that the judgment. We're all going to die, every one of us. Every person ever walked the face of the earth is going to die and stand before the judgment see, or before the judgment of God. And we'll not be judged on how good we were or how bad we were. You don't go to hell for being bad any more than you go to heaven for being good. But were you covered with the blood? And so that means that any other religion is not good enough. That means that it is a narrow way, that the way is narrow and the gate is straight. And that does mean that I am the only way, the truth, and the life, as Jesus said. Unless you're covered by the blood of Jesus Christ, unless your grandkids are covered by the blood of Jesus Christ, unless your neighbors are covered 
by the blood of Jesus Christ. Let's look at Exodus chapter 12, verse 11. This whole uh, chapter deals with the Passover. I'll just uh, read a couple of verses that, that are up on the screen, and then I'm going to read some more of the book. So if you want to go ahead and turn there, more of the chapter, I will be in chapter 12. I'm reading out of the New Living Translation this morning. But verse 11, chapter 12, verse 11. These are your instructions for eating this meal. So the Passover was about a meal also. It was getting ready. Uh, and he told them exactly what he wanted them to do, how he wanted to prepare the meal. And, and it was to be from, from now on, every year, they were to celebrate uh, what, what God did and, and freeing them from Egypt. These are your instructions for eating this meal. Be fully dressed. Wear your sandals. Carry your walking stick in your hand. Eat the meal with urgency, for this is the Lord's Passover. See, this they'd not had this before. This is where it started uh, in getting them out of bondage in Egypt. On that night, I will pass through the land of Egypt. I want you to get that. I will. Uh, this is the Lord speaking. I will pass through the land of Egypt and strike down every firstborn son and firstborn male animal in the land of Egypt. I will execute judgment against all the gods of Egypt, for I am the Lord. So this is God speaking. God saying, I'm involved. I'm coming to Egypt. I'm going to strike down uh, every firstborn male in the land of Egypt, both uh, human and animal or at least uh, cattle and uh, that, that type of animal. Don't know that he killed every squirrel or every whatever, but, uh, but the blood on your doorpost will serve as a sign. So they'd been told what to do. But the blood on the doorpost will serve as a sign, marking the houses where you're staying. And when I see the blood, what does your Bible say after that? I dare say they all say the same thing. I will pass over you. That's the promise that God made to the children of Egypt, or to the children of Israel in Egypt. He made this promise to Moses. When I see the blood, I will pass over you. And the plague of death will not touch you when I strike the land of Egypt. And I'm going to drop down to verse 21. And then Moses called the elders of Israel together and said to them, Go pick out a lamb or a young goat for each of your families and slaughter the Passover animal. So something had to die. Later, it, it was always a lamb. But in this first uh, account, perhaps that they didn't have enough lambs. We, I, I don't know, but uh, he said a, a young lamb or a young goat for each of your families and kill it, slaughter it, and drain the blood into a basin. That's a picture of death. That's a picture of sacrifice. That's not a picture of, of just a hardship. That's a picture of complete sacrifice and death. This little lamb died for no fault of its own. Drain the blood into a basin. And then take a bundle of hyssop branches. Let's do a little aside here. You don't normally think about hyssop branches too much, do you? You probably don't know much about hyssop branches. A hyssop branch was, a, was and is a small little uh, lemmy kind of a plant. And it was the, the hyssop plant that the priests were later instructed to use and dip in water and to sprinkle on any person that had been pronounced unclean in order to pronounce them now clean. And, of course, Leviticus gives us umpteen number of laws that we just get ready to read right on through, uh, but all dealing with uh, what either blood or water have been sprinkled. And so you take this lemmy little plant and dip it, in our case, in blood, but in other cases, in water, and just fling it, sprinkle it. It would just, it would just kind of splatter uh, as they 
rake it across the doorpost. It was just going to be a, a light streaking. I mean, it wasn't like a paintbrush or a roller and just an inch thick of blood up there. I mean, all we can really think about because of the hyssop would have been this little streaky amount of blood. But when God saw what they had believed in him and by faith administered that blood up over the doorpost that was sufficient, he passed over them. Hyssop then became uh, known as being associated with cleanliness or even with holiness, that something has been set aside. Something has been set aside as clean and holy. And so it's almost, if you will, as when God, when Moses wanted to see God and God said, okay, I'll walk by you and I'll hold my hand over uh, so that you can't see me when I walk by, but then I'll remove my hand. He, in a sense, set Moses aside and held, held his hand out over uh, Moses until he got by, and then Moses watched him as he, as he left. That's the idea that the cleanliness has about uh, setting something aside as, as being clean, as being uh, holy to the Lord. David would later write in Psalms 51, and Psalms 51 is the chapter on just pouring your heart out to God for forgiveness. Psalms 51 deals with his sin of Bathsheba and the fact that Nathan had brought it to his attention, and it truly broke his heart. Psalms 51 is how God could later say he's a man after my own heart. Take Psalms 51 out of the David story and you scratch your head over how God could ever uh, say that about David. But David's heart was broken when he penned Psalms 51 about his iniquity and his sin and his transgression. He used all three of the Hebrew words for, for sin when he just broke, broke his heart and poured his heart out, out to God, and it's 51 and 7, purge me with hyssop. Y'all have heard that, and you've wondered what it meant probably. Purge me with hyssop, and I shall be clean. Wash me, and I'll be whiter than snow. What is what is a, a branch got to do with anything? It's not the branch. It's not the physical plant. It's what it had come to represent. It had come to represent Uh, being clean and holy before God. And so it was with the hyssop plant that we first see here in the Passover that later got used over and over as being something of completeness, of cleanliness, of dedicated, completely set aside to God. Now, think with me when the hyssop plant got used again that you probably remember. In John chapter 19 and verse 28, after this, Jesus, knowing that all things had already been accomplished to fulfill the scriptures, said, I am thirsty. Where is he at? He's hanging on the cross, isn't he? And he just said, uh, knowing that all things had been accomplished, that the scriptures were being fulfilled in him, said, I am thirsty. I am thirsty. What did they give him? Vinegar on what? On a hyssop branch. A jar full of sour wine was standing there, so they put a sponge full of the sour wine upon a branch of hyssop and brought it to his mouth. And when Jesus had received the sour wine, he said what? It is finished. It was a representative, uh, the hyssop represented of cleanliness, of finality, of being set aside to God. And Jesus Christ did exactly what God sent him to do in full obedience to his Father. And the pictures follow him through the scripture about even down to a hyssop plant. You see how interesting the Bible is when you get into it and study it and look for the types and the pictures and and what God is telling us. And and the first one, they didn't, uh, this first time, they didn't have a clue. He could have said, grab your overalls and dip it in blood and spread it out. It wouldn't have mattered. But 
the fact that they used the hyssop branch and then that became something that God would use all the way on through Scripture to represent cleanliness is what uh, God told Moses. So back to our text in 22. Take a bunch of hyssop branches and dip it into the blood. So get that picture. You just got a little a plant, I mean, like a, like a little azalea bush. It's little short, stubby, little branches on it. And they've dipped it in the blood of this lamb. And then brush it across the top and down the sides of the door frames of your houses. And no one may go out through the door until morning. For the Lord will pass through the land to strike down the Egyptians. But when he sees the blood... On the top and the sides of the door frame, the door the Lord will pass over your home. He will not permit, this is new, new Living Translation, He will not permit His death angel, your Bible probably says destroyer. He will not permit the destroyer to enter your house and strike you down. That's an interesting phrase. Death angel might be. Uh, what's in mind here, but it might not be. It literally was the Lord himself coming through the land of Egypt. It was God Almighty that, was, that had uh, come down from heaven and was going to lead his people out of bondage. And he was going to use uh, this, uh, the blood of a lamb uh, to, be the, to be their deliverer, their redeemer, but he was going to use the destroyer. On another occasion, one angel killed 100,000 Assyrians in one night. So we don't know. We do know that God was, was there and that he, he literally was telling them he would kill the firstborn if there was no blood over the door. That would have been, like I said, that would have been Israelite as well as Egyptian had the blood not been applied. In verse 24, remember these instructions are a permanent law that you and your descendants must observe forever. When you enter the land of the Lord has promised to give you, you will continue to observe this ceremony. And when your children ask, what does this ceremony mean? And you will reply, it is the Passover sacrifice to the Lord. For he passed over the houses of the Israelites in Egypt. And though he struck the Egyptians, he spared our families. And when Moses had finished speaking, all the people bowed down to the ground and worshipped. And so the people of Israel did just as the Lord had commanded through Moses and Aaron. And that night at midnight... The Lord struck down all the firstborn sons in the land of Egypt. What a night that would have been. I mean, I don't know, Barry, if you were in here a moment ago, I mentioned that that two-month-old baby had died. There were two-month-old firstborn babies in Egypt. I mean, had to have been that died. There was one-year-olds and two-year-olds and five-year-olds and 85-year-olds. And all the firstborn of Egypt died at God's hand. Sin's a serious matter, isn't it? Sin is a serious matter. I had an opportunity to be on the road yesterday, and I listened to some podcasts for several hours. And it's not a new thought, but it just made me me think anew about sin and if you boil sin down to kind of the the common base denominator I guess you'd say sin is just me loving me more than I love God me whatever my stuff my health my possessions my kids my anything when God wasn't, when Jesus, as God, but when Jesus was asked what's the greatest command was what? To love who? To love the Lord your God with all your heart, soul, mind, and body. And the second one is namely like it and love your sin 
is not loving God or your neighbor first. Sin in its basic form and in any area you want to look at, just sin is me loving me more than me loving commandment one or commandment two. And God wants us to, to love him and to love our neighbor. And he's very, very, very serious about this matter of, of sin and what it's going to do in our lives and to the human race to the point that he, he, he personally intervened in the destruction of every first born human male of Egypt. Verse 29, And that night at midnight the Lord struck down all the firstborn sons in the land of Egypt. And from the firstborn son of Pharaoh, who sat on his throne, to the firstborn son of the prisoner in the dungeon, so Buddy, it didn't matter, did it? It was no status. Even the firstborn of their livestock were killed. And Pharaoh and all his officers and all the people of Egypt woke up during the night with a loud wailing that was heard throughout all the land of Egypt. And there was not a single house where someone had not died. So the Passover was... <laughs> I mean, how do we do it justice to say that it was a horrible night for the, for the Egyptians? But for the Israelites, those that put the blood up over the doorpost and down the sides of the doorpost had a story that when their children would ask from generation to generation to generation, they would tell their children what God had done for them down in the land of Egypt. Because when you turn the flip side and you look at Israel and you look at the victory that they had that day, they were down there in a hopeless situation. There was no way, even if you watch the Ten Commandments and you see Charleston Heston and, and he don't have to look like Moses when I get to heaven. Or, you know, I'm not, I'm not don't recognize Moses if he don't look like Charleston Heston. But when we get to heaven... Uh, and, and, and Charleston Heston or Moses uh, in, in, in the movie, when he's standing before the Pharaoh and the Pharaoh says, are you the deliverer? And Moses says, I am not the deliverer. It would take far more than a man to deliver e Israel out of Egypt. But here's what got him thrown out. But if I could, <laughs> I would lead Israel out of Egypt. And so it was an impossible situation from every human perspective for Israel to have ever left Egypt. But Egypt actually ran them out of town. I don't know if it's asking too much of God to say this. I don't think so. I mean, this is a story all to itself. But we see stories, as, as the New Testament says, they're written as examples for us in the New Testament. An example of the Passover would be, is anything too hard for God? Humanly impossible. Just, just turn and walk away. It just is not going to happen. But it did <laughs> when God got involved. And so church this morning, we don't know what God's up to in our lives and what might happen. And we may go through some tremendous hardships before we ever come out on the other side. But rest assured that God's in control. Nothing is too hard for God to bless us. Fast forward into the New Testament and we find uh, uh, Jesus telling the, the disciples to go find a place to observe the last Passover meal. In fact, Matthew 26, 17 says, On the first day of the festival of unleavened bread, the disciples came to Jesus and asked him, Where do you want us to prepare the Passover meal for you? So all through these generations, 
for the most part, they've observed the Passover. There's been times that they didn't because of sin, and God had punished them because of it. And so Jesus, knowing that he was about to, to fulfill the, the Old Testament, the, the Old Covenant, it was going to be fulfilled in him. He was to observe the last Passover meal, and so they make it ready to observe the, the last Passover meal. I know, Miss Nancy, y'all like Warren Wearsby, Miss Pat. Ward loved Warren Wearsby commentary, and I think y'all probably still use them in, in your Bible story. Warren Wearsby says this, In one sense, the message of the Bible can be summed up in this. The question in the Old Testament is, where is the Lamb? That was the question Isaac put to his father Abraham. It's a good question. Where is the Lamb? And we know that Scripture then revealed that the ram had his horns hung in a thicket, and Abraham was able to go over and get the ram and put it to death. That's what a sacrifice means. He killed that ram. He shed blood. He laid the ram out on the altar. The Old Testament is, where is the lamb? And the New Testament starts out with a fiery Baptist preacher, at least his name was John the Baptist, saying, Behold, the Lamb of God that takes away the sins of the world. The New Testament starts out declaring who Jesus Christ is as the ultimate sacrifice for all the sacrificial system, for all the festivals, for everything Israel had observed was looking forward to the one that would come and, uh, and fulfill everything. And then just as we read a couple of weeks ago in, in Revelation chapter 5, the end times is going to be and all of heaven and the four creatures and, and, and uh, the elders all singing or shouting with a loud voice, worthy is the lamb. It's always been about the lamb. It was the lamb from, uh, from Abraham and, and Isaac and, and the sacrificial system and the Passover lamb and the day of atonement and right on into the rapture and the end, ending of time, the Passover lamb was looking forward to Jesus Christ. Paul says in 1 Corinthians 5 and 7, he makes it real plain to the church, that's you and I today, the body of Christ. He wants us to know Christ, our Passover lamb, has been sacrificed for us. That's just part of that verse, but let's read it out loud. It's for you today, church. Christ, our Passover lamb, has been sacrificed for us. Death, bloodshed, he gave his life that you and I might have life. And Peter says in 1 Peter 1, 18, For you know that God paid a ransom to save you from the empty life. God paid a ransom. You know this is what he's saying. Christians today, you know this. Peter's already said, I'm here to remind you of things, but for you know that God paid a ransom to save you from the empty life you inherited from your ancestors. And the ransom he paid was not mere gold or silver. It was the precious blood of Christ, the sinless, spotless Lamb of God. God chose him as your ransom long before the world began. It wasn't... It wasn't just an afterthought with God, but he has now revealed him to you in these last days. In Hebrews, the writer of Hebrews says, In fact, according to the law of Moses, nearly everything was purified with blood. For without the shedding of blood, there is no forgiveness of sin. For God's will was for us to be made holy, by the sacrifice of the body of Jesus Christ once for all time. Under the old covenant, the priest stands and ministers before the altar day after day, offering the same sacrifices again and again, which can never take away sins. In fact, in another place in the book of Hebrews, it says, if the blood of bulls and goats could have took away sins, then they never would have ceased. I mean, why would Christ have wanted to go through what he went through and die on a cross if indeed there was another way? And if indeed 
there was another way. Who's to say how many other ways there might have been? Every world religion could claim then that their way was good enough. But Jesus Christ, second person in the Trinity, God the Creator, God the Redeemer, spoke and the worlds jumped into existence, had a plan before he ever spoke anything into existence that he would give his life as a ransom for me and for you, that you would not have to die and go to a devil's hell because of the sin of Adam in rejecting and not being obedient to the Father. Verse 17, but our high priest, and that's Jesus Christ, he's become our high priest, but our high priest offered himself to God as a single sacrifice for sins. Well, I think this is a great <laughs> rebuke against losing your salvation. If you lost your salvation, how you don't get it back without a sacrifice? Our high priest offered himself to God as a single sacrifice for sins, good for all time. And then he sat down in the place of honor at God's right hand. There he waits until the enemies are humbled, until his enemies are humbled and made a footstool under his feet. For by that one offering he forever made perfect those who are being holy. The one sacrifice of Jesus Christ forever made it possible to have the blood applied. So let's wrap it up and let's compare the two. Just as a, a big meal on a table wouldn't have done you any good, no matter how hungry you are, if you, didn't, if you don't eat it. It wouldn't have mattered how many lambs got killed that night. It wouldn't have mattered how many tubfuls of blood, uh, how many hundreds, thousands, millions of basins uh, would have been filled with blood that night. Every... Jew, every Israelite, every firstborn of Israel would have died as certainly as every Egyptian died. If not by faith, believing the word of God and taking the blood and applying it over the door and down the sides. Jesus Christ has died sufficiently only one time. Only one time's needed because in his death, he paid for sin. Paul makes that very plain. Not sins. He often talked about sins as in the daily sins that we do, that we're, we're dirty from the world. We, we commit sins, plural. Sin is always talked about differently as the sin of unbelief, the sin of rejecting the one who died, the one who made uh, available the, the blood that was sufficient for anyone to be saved. But no matter how many tubfuls, bucketfuls, whatever you want to say, of blood had been made available, had they not availed themselves to it by faith, they would have died. And so is it today. Anyone who doesn't apply the blood of Jesus Christ to their life dies. It's of no value whatsoever to them if they don't apply it by faith in what the Word of God has said. Familiar story when Egypt, when Israel was wandering out in the wilderness and they began to murmur and complain, which was a regular affair for them. And have we really, have we really changed any? You know, we want to give Israel a hard time for wandering 40 years out in the wilderness. And you know, really boil down what they were doing? They were just doing the same thing that they'd always done. They didn't like to change. <laughs> now, that's an activate term. Y'all might hear a little bit more about that, but it struck me this week that while we want to uh, just really knock Israel over the head for being so backslidden, if we just get in a rut and do the same things over and over and not, not trying to mature, not trying to grow, not trying to be the Christian that the New Testament 
clearly wants us to be, then we're no different. We're just, we're just going through life, and, and, and life is tough. I mean, we know that. We're just, we're just kind of uh, in a rut. We're just trying to kind of get along. And that's what the Israelites were doing for 40 years out in the wilderness. But on this one particular occasion, they got to really murmuring, and God sent the serpents. And every, every person that the serpent bit, did they just get sick and go lay down for a little while, or what happened to them? They died, didn't they? The scriptures are very plain. God sent the serpents because of their disobedience to bite them, and every person bit died except. Don't you always like to accept clauses in scripture? Except God made a way of deliverance. Moses, build you a brazen serpent on a pole and raise that pole up and you tell everybody to look. You don't tell them to go to the doctor. You don't tell them to go take some medicine. You don't tell them to go lay down and take a nap. You tell them to look at that serpent and they'll live. And everybody that looked, the scripture says, at the serpent lived. And you just have to know there's some that was too hard-headed that didn't, that didn't look. Too many excuses, too many reasons. That's the stupidest thing I ever heard. Just, I mean, you know mankind, we come up with our reasons. And Jesus or, or God telling Moses, it's just that simple. Put the blood over the doorpost and live. Raise up the serpent and look and live. Jesus Christ finishing it all, hanging on a cross, said it's finished. It's done. It's all done. There's nothing more you can do. There's nothing needed. We're not worthy to do anything about it. It's just done. And you're either going to look with faith or you're not. Glenn's don't come this morning and, and sing a song just a cappella. And we'll ask if you would just to bow your heads for a